shift to electric drive personal transportation is well underway here in the United States. Last year alone, sales of electrified vehicles more than doubled. China electric vehicle is already being sold by the public. In 2022, the sales of electric vehicle will exceed 500,000 vehicles. California makes up only 10% of all the cars in the United States, but we now account for over 40% of the nation's zero emission cars. That's because we placed a big bet on EVs more than a decade ago with innovative programs and incentives to drive the sale of zero emission vehicles. Ireland's EV market share continues to grow each year. However, affordability and concerns over the charging network remain key issues for consumers. In 2021, 1.7% of sales in Australia were battery electric vehicles. This low number reflects the lack of government attention to this important issue. By the end of this decade, the auto industry globally will have invested 515 billion dollars in electrification. Great stuff. Well, listen. Welcome to my panelists here on the stage, to Eric Mark and to Emma as well, and to my panelists who are joining us remotely.、Uh, we've got John and Leanne from the U.S. So thank you so much for joining us. I think a special welcome to Tony in the U. in Australia, though, because Tony, what time is it there? It's、uh, about quarter two in the morning. Oh. Well, well, respect. That is very good of you to join us. I must say, thank you so much. And、uh, well, I mean, what, what, what more fun could you have? <laughs> Quarter to two in the morning than addressing us here.、Um, now, listen. We're going to, as I say, we're going to sort of have a bit of a, a, a sort of scoot around the world to see. If, Where we are in different territories with EV take up, and so quite straightforwardly, I am going to ask each of you to expand on what you just told us in, in the little film there,、um, and perhaps, well, where should we go first? L- Leanne, let's go to you first、uh, in California, and、uh, tell us where you are in your region on sort of key <coughs> policy and regulatory drives and so on and so forth, and how are things going over there? So we just recently、um, passed the one million mark、uh, in terms of electric vehicles sold in the state of California,、um, and that's been a huge increase. In 2011, we were at about 7,000 annual、uh, vehicle sales, and last year we were over 250,000. So the、uh, pace has accelerated dramatically.、Um, And、uh, sort of as I mentioned in my little clip there, I mean, part of it, part of that was setting clear regulatory markers and building a framework for、uh, automakers to plan and、uh, and develop business plans that would really take advantage of our regulatory structure. And it also included、uh, incredible work in the infrastructure space. Um, we started with working through our utilities and requiring our utilities to uh, begin uh, deploying the infrastructure. But we've had other opportunities as well, including the、uh, the settlement agreement with Volkswagen、um, coming from the、uh, their diesel issues that really has、uh, driven a, a significant electric、uh, vehicle charging market、um, infrastructure market in California and in Senate. Uh, ensuring that we have incentives both at the national and the state level to help customers acquire vehicles, and all of those strategies、uh, have come together, and we are really seeing a strong acceleration in uptake. Because of course, because of course, seeing, seeing your title being、uh, you, you're there, chair of the California Air Resources Board, it's very clear what your motivation is to encourage electrification. I mean, how is that going? What are the actual results? For you, in terms of air quality. Well, we have at、uh, the Air Resources Board, we have a mandate to improve air quality in California, and for decades we have been successful in improving the emissions from internal combustion engine vehicles、um, and moving towards electrification. And we've had huge success over time in cleaning our air. We still have areas of non-attainment. Um, and we still have a long way to go. But you know, when I was a kid in Southern California, you would go outside on smoggy days and your eyes would water,、um, and that is is very very uncommon now.、Um, and the other、uh, key regulatory role for CARB is、um, on climate change.、Uh, 
um, and implementing our climate change goals. And transportation electrification and, and decarbonization is a critical part of, of our strategy in our climate change um, area. And we have both reduced our greenhouse gas emissions over time since our landmark climate change legislation was passed, and we've grown our economy at the same time. Uh, so those strategies have come together to bring success to California, um, and we will continue our uh, aggressive goals um, to decarbonize by mid-century or sooner. Well, bravo, well, bravo so far. So. Um, Eric Mark, you're here as DG of the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. So with that hat on, how are things going? Let's give us a bit of a progress report. Yeah, I think Europe uh, is, is way ahead of most uh, continents. Um, I think the real reason behind that is uh, simply the fact that there are huge penalties uh, if you don't comply. Uh, so that was a good start. I think that start together with uh, some manufacturers from, from California that, that conquered the market uh, was the start for our sector in Europe to really develop. When you now look at the Nordic countries, the Netherlands, I'm Dutch, we see a huge acceleration. I think the majority of cars currently sold in the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden is electric. The best selling cars are electric cars. The minority is now still uh, petrol and diesel is almost gone. Um, so that is a huge turning point. Uh, there is also uh, 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 a very important factor playing, which is that governments really see this development uh, going forward. Cities are investing in charging infrastructure, and that is a huge uh, difference when I come here in London and I compare that to uh, Amsterdam, for example. In Amsterdam, every corner has a charging station. Uh, you see the majority of cars is electric. And uh, I haven't seen a charging station here yet. And I've been here one and a half day. And uh, it is hard to find. When I talk to a ca taxi driver here in, in London and I ask him about this electric taxi he's driving, he say, oh, it's rubbish. The battery doesn't even work. Chinese brand, uh, terrible. So I hear different stories here than I hear in Europe. Yeah, um, you've got to, you've got of course, London taxi driver, haven't you? you really have. Maybe the reference <laughs> should not be the taxi driver, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, of course. No, but in, in Europe, I think we are really taking serious the fact that we need to develop infrastructure. And uh, the members of parliament and the commission in Brussels, uh, where, where, I, uh, where we have our office, is taking this serious now. The regulation is, is not a vague directive, it's really a regulation. Uh, member states get penalties, at least that's not decided, but it's going that way, get penalties if they don't deliver. Because the electric cars are there. We will be green well before 2050. We will be green well before 2040. Uh, the 55% target against 20, last year, we will easily get. The majority of our brands is ahead of the schedule. Um, we see uptake in electric cars is going, it's a little bit like electric, uh, like uh, mobile phones. At first you saw a few people and now everybody wants the electric car. Um, we see, uh, I, I was uh, with my uh, grandchildren, I was visiting a, a football match and then the, the parents drive the children to the next match and uh, these children are running to one of the electric cars, uh, mine, for example, and say, I want to be in the electric car. I don't want to be in the other car. And that's amazing. If, if you know, children four or five, six years old are already seeing that mind shift, that is really happening. It's happening in the northern part of Europe. It is gradually happening in Germany and France. Uh, there is a quick uptake there. Southern Europe, still a little bit more difficult. Eastern Europe, a little behind. But uh, I think even Eastern Europe is now preparing because they need to prepare because they know that their, uh, the, their citizens want to buy electric cars because the fuel price is so high that when you live in a lower cost of living, when you have, yeah, you want to have a lower, you have, you, you have a lower income in Eastern Europe 
And when the majority of your income is spent on gasoline, you are looking for alternatives. And alternatives could be second-hand plug-in hybrid vehicles from the rest of Europe. And that is driving the demand and the demand for charging infrastructure in Eastern Europe as well. We've had a lot of discussion this morning about the, the, yeah. the anxiety around charging infrastructure here in the UK. And we saw some interesting stats that in parts of Europe, of course, the, the, there, are, there aren't many chargers. Athens, I think, has 22 charging points, yeah, for example. So with the sort of a broad European hat on, you said that you're going, you felt the regulation was going to become uh, quite punitive. I mean, how's it actually going to work, though? I mean, are there lessons that you think we should be taking from the UK? Because it seems that it's a very mixed picture in Europe at the moment. Yeah, but I think the mixed picture is gradually um, going away and everybody is following what is happening in the Netherlands, Germany. And so it's top-down regulation saying yeah. you have to put in you have to put yeah, in Yeah, that is good. On the other hand, if you put, and that's the reason why I bought my first electric car in Amsterdam, uh, which was in 2011 already, was that the uh, on-street parking was not possible in Amsterdam at all. But when you had an electric car, there were empty spots and you could charge your car there. And that was the momentum that the city created and London could do the same. The momentum that the city created to make sure that people saw those empty spots and wanted an electric car because at least they could park and they could charge their car at that point in time for free. Now not anymore, of course. Uh, and it's the same in Norway where um, when you have an electric car, you can use the bus lanes and skip the traffic jams. It was, this, and that was the time before now, because of course that has gone, because the majority of the cars in Norway is already electric, and then you cannot do that anymore, otherwise the bus is always standing still. But these kind of measures are really helping the uptake and the demand, and we have, we basically we see a demand driving scenario that uh, governments could, could stimulate, where you see indeed the empty spots where you could charge and you see the abundance of charging infrastructure that really drives demand. On top of that, the high fuel prices and the whole package in Europe, which is called uh, the Green Deal or the Fit for 55 package, where prices of gasoline go up, prices of carbon emissions go up, prices of electricity are lowered on member state level by lowering the taxes on electricity. And then you see an automatic total cost of ownership pressure, pressure uh, that it is much cheaper and much more efficient and much more fun to drive a new, new electric car. Yeah, um, yeah it's very interesting having the insight and very from, good from the ground on Europe because yeah. we've been discussing some of these ideas in theory this morning. Um, Emma, whilst we're on the subject, how, th how are things looking in Ireland? Well, our government have committed to 51% um, emissions reductions uh, from transport by 2030. Um, and they've also, um, you know, I think they're broadly relying on people switching to walking, cycling, perhaps using public uh, transport, and largely relying on people switching to low emission vehicles. If anyone's been to Dublin, the public transport isn't that great. You're so blessed here in London. Um, and I think ultimately, the challenge is they're going to continue to increase the cost of ICE vehicles um, through taxation. Um, and you know we have a CO2-based tax that goes from 7% to 41% of the, the price of the car based on the CO2 emissions. And um, I suppose ultimately we need the grants and the supports to remain. Now we have seen a very um, impressive change in the market. In 2019, 4% of the market was um, plug-in hybrid or uh, fully electric, that's grown to 20% so far this year. Um, and it would be higher, on, um, but there's obviously the supply constraints. And it's expected that that will grow to 48% in 2025, although it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in the next three weeks, let alone the next three years. So, you know, it is changing. The attitudes are changing. It's, it's good to see someone mentioned, I think, once you hit the 10% mark market yeah, share, point, yeah. you get to see them everywhere, you know. Um, people start to experience them. You're in taxis, they're electric vehicles, you know, they're talking about it mostly positively. Um, so I think, you know, we're, it, it's a very exciting time and that's been mentioned throughout the day. Um, we're really on the verge of, of something taking off. Let's go over to the States now and speak to John Bozella, um, President and CEO of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Um, John, I would imagine that the picture in, in America is pretty uh, regionally diverse. Would that be fair? I think that is a very fair way to look at it. Um, you heard Chair Randolph describe 
uh, uh, a burgeoning uh, and exciting market in California where uh, sales of EVs are about 13 percent uh, of new vehicle sales. Uh, across the country here in the United States, that number is closer to 4%. Now, that said, sales in the United States in 2021 doubled um, year over year. Um, but still, that's 2.2 million vehicles out of a car park of um, 283 million vehicles in the United States. So we have a long way to go. A lot of excitement, a lot of momentum in the marketplace. There are 78 uh, individual electrified models in the marketplace here in the United States. That number will double uh, by 2025. So you're seeing the investment, you're seeing the leadership um, from companies. Um, really what we need though, as you think about um, the future and getting to you know, our shared goals of say half uh, half the market being EVs uh, across the country by, say, 2030, um, that is going to require a comprehensive national strategy. Regulation is important because, as, as Leanne said, it set, creates certainty and a pathway uh, for innovation. But we've got to move beyond that. We're going to need private sector engagement. We're going to need utilities uh, to generate cleaner energy. We're going to need distribu different distribution and pricing models for electricity. We're going to need business codes, uh, excuse me, building codes at the residential and commercial level to ensure that new buildings are charging ready. And frankly, we're going to need public policy beyond regulation policy that starts with the consumer and addresses affordability and awareness. And by the way, the average transaction price for an electric vehicle in the United States today is $63,000. In contrast to the average transaction price of a hybrid vehicle, which is about $32,000. So we need to focus on affordability and awareness. Uh, we heard our colleague from uh, Volvo mention incentives, for example, that does uh, improve awareness. Uh, and improve affordability at a point at which we need to move from 4% to 50% or 60% and ultimately to 100%. Infrastructure is critically important. You've all seen the news that the US Congress and the President uh, of the United States agreed on a bipartisan investment uh, in US infrastructure that includes $7.5 billion in EV charging and hydrogen fueling infrastructure. It's a great down payment, but it's not enough. We have to continue to build out there. And finally, this transformation is going to require us to reimagine the industrial base in the United States. Uh, and that means transforming uh, from an, uh, an ICE industrial base to an EV industrial base. It's going to need a, mean a focus on new supply chains. Uh, if, if American consumers uh, and American communities and American auto workers are also going to participate in the benefits uh, of this transformation. And so um, that's really, I think, the big focus. And, and I think what you'll hear from many of us is that collaboration is the critical next step to success. But ultimately, the customer is going to decide whether we're going to be successful or not. It strikes, it strikes me, and it might be a very uh, broad generalization of me to make, but it strikes me that the cultural shift for the American car driver is going to be perhaps a more, a more tough sell than in other areas of the world. Is that fair or am I just falling for all those sort of Hollywood cliches of, uh, of the, the great truck driving states of the South? Yes, the wide open spaces. Um, you know, I would say yes and no. Um, you know, of course, um, at 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 four percent of the market, what you're seeing is affluent urban and suburban buyers who have single family homes with a garage and access to, a, you know, a, a 200 amp panel to be able to charge their vehicle. When we get to 10, 15, 20, 30 percent of the market, we're going to have to appeal to people who live in apartment buildings uh, and people who don't have access to garages. We're, have, we're going to have to appeal to not only urban uh, users of personal transportation, but suburban and rural owners. Uh, what you are seeing in the marketplace, by the way, is, uh, and all of you are quite aware of this, I'm sure, we're seeing EV pickup trucks, which should appeal 
uh, to rural buyers. We are seeing uh, SUVs and CUVs, compact utility vehicles or crossover utility vehicles coming into the market. So when you get to that 130, 140 different models in the marketplace by mid-decade, I do think you will be seeing more options for more consumers. But yes, there's no question across the broad expanse of the United States, um, there will be a bit of choppiness in terms of uptake, in terms of penetration uh, and customer um, uh, acceptance of this technology. Well, I'm going to just pause our live chat for a couple of minutes because we're going to get insight now into the progress of the world's largest automotive market. Um, and we have a, highlights now of a pre-recorded speech from the Executive Vice Chairman and Secretary General of the China Association of Automobile Manufacturers, Fu Bingfang. China, as the world's largest car manufacturer and consumer, is in the process of maintaining a green economy, and is developing new cars as a national strategy, establishing a national government, local government, and industry partners to help the development of green car development efforts. In recent years, the Chinese government has been supporting the development of green car development, 持续完善顶层设计，随后又推出一系列支持政策，各地方政府结合实际出台相关配套政策，尤其是新能源汽车财税政策，持续调整完善，补贴范围从试点区推向全国，涵盖公共领域和私家用车。中国新能源汽车已经广为消费者接受。二零二二二年，新能源汽车销量预计将达到五百万辆。从中长期来看，预计到二零二五年，新能源汽车销量占比将达到百分之二十。后补贴时代，国家部委将不断释放市场需求，持续完善后市场。探索更多商业模式，调整优化汽车管理政策，破除制约汽车购买使用障碍，逐步放开限购城市，释放汽车消费潜力，也学习欧洲国家关于路权开放等成功经验，为新能源汽车从购买到使用持续创造良好环境。Fascinating highlight there of that uh, interview with uh, with our colleague from China there, Fu Bingfeng, and the full speech is available on the Knowledge Centre if you'd like to see some more. We'll see another clip in a short while as well. Um, Eric Mark, if I can just turn to you, I think it was Dr. Becker earlier, who I know is a close colleague and friend of yours, who made the point that it's you know when we look at the success of China in uptake of electric vehicles, it's much easier when you can have that centralised top-down structure imposed upon the market when you can't even tell the local you know, mayor of a small town in Germany you must put in a charging yeah. point. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah, that really helps. And uh, we have an office uh, as well uh, in Beijing and we're working closely with uh, Fu and the, the team around him with Kam. Um, and I think the example is a good example. Uh, governments need to play a leading role uh, following now what is already happening in the automotive industry. Uh, and it used to be that the government dictated targets. Those targets are now being surpassed. Uh, if you look at, for example, um, battery production, every, uh, every plant we have in Europe producing cars should probably be have such have the same size plant for battery production, preferably in Europe or the UK next to it. Currently, we're completely dependent on China for batteries, and I think that should change as well. So I think European and UK governments should really think, what should we do next? We now have pushed with targets. The automotive sector is following, and we are now overachieving uh, the levels of rollout of, of electric cars. But when this goes on, I see two problems. Charging infrastructure, 
and battery capacity and battery production in Europe. We are going to be fully dependent on what is happening in China. I don't think that is wise. Leanne, may I turn to you and just get your response as well to hearing from Lu Bingfeng and, and also to sort of put in context where you feel the regulatory structure needs to move in your region, in California, in order to, to achieve even greater results? Um, you know, as, as Eric mentioned, you know, we, we set targets and, um, and the manufacturers are actually stepping up and complying and exceeding. Um, and so I think a lot of our challenges are around um, supply, uh, as Eric mentioned. I mean, we in California are looking at a significant source of lithium in Southern California in an effort to uh, be able to produce our own uh, raw materials. And we have several auto manufacturers who are uh, looking at that possibility. Um, and, uh, and we also need to be mindful of our equity challenges uh, in terms of pricing, in terms of making sure there's a variety of vehicles on the market and that those vehicles are being made available um, to folks who can't afford um, the higher end, uh, more expensive models. So thinking about the secondary market and ensuring that vehicles are available in the secondary market, that's one of sort of the regulatory levers that we're looking at carefully in our, um, in our rulemaking we're undergoing that will start with model year 2026 and going forward. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, thinking about um, uh, uh, ways that we can um, encourage vehicle sharing. Um, we have vehicle sharing programs that have been very successful in California where EVs are made available to organizations that um, provide them to residents who don't have their own car and where public transportation is a little more spotty. Um, so thinking about all of those uh, those different levers um, in terms of not just the production of the vehicles and the vehicles in the, in the wild, but also who they're coming to and how they're being used. And we're looking at all of those factors. Tony, we've not heard from you from the picture down under. Tell us what's happening with the electric vehicle market there. And, and, and having listened to the experiences now from North America, from Europe, from Ireland, from, um, from, uh, from China as well, how does the Australian picture fit into that? Well, the Australian picture is a very uh, sad contrast to what we've heard around the table from the others. You know, we have a very low penetration rate of battery electric vehicles at only 1.7% last year. And that I blame entirely on the fact that we do not have an automotive CO2 target in this country. So therefore, the government has a perspective of letting the market forces dominate the market. And when you do that, people do not buy vehicles when there is a price disadvantage to them and there's issues with range and infrastructure, especially in a country as big as Australia. And, and to put it in perspective how big Australia is, Australia is bigger than continental US. It's bigger than the, than thirty times, two times bigger than the UK. And we have a population of 26 million. So there's a real challenge for the private sector, how you actually provide the infrastructure to support electric vehicles in that environment over that distances that people travel in Australia. And traditionally, Australians have used their cars a lot to travel long distances. And you know, people will be surprised at distances that are involved in Australia. Like driving from Melbourne to Sydney is not that unusual, but it's 878 kilometres. Are you still with us? Still with us? Still with us? So, Sydney to Perth is 4,000 kilometres, whilst London to Moscow is only two and a half thousand kilometres. So it's a very vast country. And the fact that we don't have a target has put a lot of pressure on the industry. So what we have done in response is we have actually put in a voluntary target, but it's not as good as having a mandated government target. And that's what we want, a mandated government target, because it sends a signal to the manufacturers, none of whom are based in Australia, to send low emission vehicle technology to our market. How confident are you, Tony, that that mandate may be forthcoming? Well, we have a, uh, a federal election coming up in the next two months, but 
uh, unless there is a change of government, I'm not that hopeful at all. And even with a change of government, there is no guarantee. And I think it's a very sad outcome for the environment and it leaves us exposed to being left behind the rest of the automotive world. So if you don't get the mandate from the government, what else could you do to try and sort of uh, increase demand for LVs in, in, in the EVs in, in Australia? I mean, is it a cultural shift? Is it going to be a real kind of a, a sort of a information uh, and education priority, do you think? So we are a federation like the US, and some of the state governments are actually taking a lead in this space, but it's not optimal. And the support that they provide is around $3,000 per vehicle. Now, that's not enough, I don't believe, to, change, to move the dial. But our view is we have a, a wish list of what we want from government. The first is a mandated CO2 target. Then follows from that is infrastructure provision publicly, privately, and then access to things like non-financial incentives, bus lanes, as has been described earlier, and fleet targets, which will get a greater volume of cars in the market and then therefore in the second-hand market to actually move forward. But it is a real challenge for us. And the other big issue for us, of course, is the style of vehicle that Australians buy. And uh, when you talk about passenger motor vehicles, they are less than a quarter of our market today, and more than a quarter of our market is in light commercials, and they are um, they are what we call utilities, and those those vehicles are just not available anywhere in this part of the world in electrified form at this point in time. Tony, I'm going to take the positive view that what you're describing to us in this room is now an opportunity for people here. I think this is the way we've got to see it, not just a challenge, but an opportunity. But it's very interesting to see the contrast in the different marketplaces around the world. Let's just hear a few uh, more words from Fu Bing Fang. Oh. Chung 发展规律不慎把握出现了少数企业骗补的行为影响了正规企业及时获得应有的补贴双积分政策缺乏弹性造成积分交易价格较大波动以至于无法预测充电桩分布与使用需求不对称造成很多工桩的闲置给运营商带来经营上的困难今后随着新能源市场的快速增长充电设施还会出现瓶颈电池上游材料也会出现供需的矛盾形成市场的不稳定随着报废车辆的增多电池材料的回收也将是亟待解决的问题这需要全球车企携手努力去解决使全球车企在中国市场获得良好的发展you for being fang as well it's interesting isn't it let me just turn to you again john to to see that it's not all been plain sailing even in that very successful market in china um what lessons do you think that the american market could learn from that yeah i, I think there are a couple of things um one is we have to start from the customer and look back right i mean we do have to make sure that we are providing uh, uh affordable 
uh, vehicles. Uh, and right now, um, at this stage in the game, at four or five percent of the market, we need to do more work there. And so a partnership with government, incentives, tax credits for the purchase of these vehicles is absolutely essential. You know, the interesting we have an interesting uh, experiment happening in the United States. We have California and we have New York, two states in the United States. Both are fairly big. Both have had the same rules, the same regulations in place since the mid 1990s. And yet California is at 13 percent of the market and New York is closer to the national average at around 4 percent. Why is that? It's because California invested in those programs, invested in consumer awareness programs, invested in incentives, provided um, the types of programs that Eric Mark talked about, uh, the ability to go into uh, carpooling lanes um, during rush hours. Those things were very effective investments in infrastructure. Uh, and so those are really key lessons. Yes, the regulatory framework is important and the targets are important, but that broad based approach to government policy is, in my view, the key lesson um, that we've got to internalize in the United States to be competitive. Uh, and the last point I'd make is we do have to be focused on supply chains. Eric Mark is 100% right about the overall global alliance of this industry on China. That has to change if this industry is going to provide more affordable transportation, more equitable transportation, and opportunities for the transformation of the industry here in the United States. And so we need to continue to work on that transformation as well. And to Dr. Becker's point, more environmentally friendly transformation as well. Um, Emma, what do you reckon is possible in the next decade? Well, I think it depends. Um, you know, we are at a hugely important juncture right now. Um, the Irish government have um, put in a target to have a million EVs on the road by 2030. And I suppose just for scale, we currently have 54,000. So, you know, it's ambitious and it's possible, but it will largely depend on state support, incentives, taxation policy and the overall economic market. But I think it's hugely important that we remember the just transition in this. Um, for example, the Irish, um, the average age of uh, the national fleet in Ireland is nine years old. So we have a huge majority of people stuck in older cars. And Lisa mentioned it earlier on the panel that it's really important to view the residual values and keep that in mind. I think when we have a vibrant second-hand market, we really will have achieved the goal of, of a successful change. And um, it is important that we keep in mind those people who cannot necessarily afford a brand new EV um, and, and they need to be kept in mind with any incentives and grants. What's your realistic view of the next decade, Eric Mark? Yeah, what we expect 60 million electric cars on the road by 2030, so soon, I would say. Um, affordability, I think in many cases, is already solved by very strong uh, subsidies from some member states. Uh, you can now buy a brand new electric vehicle, 100% small EV, um, produced in Europe, in Spain, for 9,000 euro. So had a price cheaper than most vehicles which are currently on the market. And that's a small SUV, five doors, really good, made in Europe. I don't want to do advertisement for one of our members, but you can easily find it out, um, I think, yourself, although it's a Dacia Sprinter, I think it's called. But, but um, so easy, small car. So that, that is the possibility. But... The real worry I have is that when a normal car buyer with an average salary would buy a new car every three to five years and is saving every year, let's say, a couple of thousand euros or pounds to buy the new one, he's currently driving in a car, which is either diesel or gasoline, and uh, the value of that car will decrease more than what we can compensate with the price of the new electric vehicle. So these people need to make an extra investment in the coming three to five years to keep driving the same type or same model. And no politician is willing to explain that currently. And I think we, we all understand, but we now have to dare, or I'm asking the UK government, European government, to explain that hey, please start saving or uh, the government should make a package available for buying a 
EV while trading in your old diesel or, or older car and have a kind of a scrapping scheme as we sometimes call it, which is not a nice word of course, but it is practice, um, and then get extra money. Uh, on, so on top of what you made saving, you can really then buy the same car back, fully electric, zero emission. You've summed it up beautifully, Eric Mark, Emma here in the, uh, in the room. It's been such a pleasure having you here. My thanks to John, to Tony, to Leanne online there. It's been really wonderful of you to join us. Tony, go to bed, sleep well. Thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Thank you all.